Welcome to the E. coli update webinar. Hi, I'm Dale Moore and I'm, I'll be your moderator for this session. This program comes to you with a grant from USDA and it's to foster science and outreach and it's focused on E. coli 015787. Here's the now, although we've planned this webinar for quite some time, if you've been paying attention to the news, you've been seeing a lot of headlines about E. coli 015787 as well as other shigatoxin producing E. coli's. And so unfortunately, our webinar and the information we're going to provide you is very timely. Our focus for today is to look at current perspectives of E. coli on human health. We're also going to talk about STEX and produce and what the role of cattle is in the e ecology and epidemiology of O15787H7. We'll also discuss some pre-harvest controls on um, does fat cattle feeding have anything to do with um, O15787H7 shedding? And what about vaccination? Is there any evidence to support vaccination as a pre-harvest control measure? And hopefully you'll stay for the whole presentation because at the end of the webinar we'll have a panel discussion that might get quite lively. I want to introduce all of our speakers before they get started. Our first speaker, I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Phil Tarr, who's a professor of pediatrics at the Washington School of Medicine in St. Louis. And he's been there since 2003. Before that, he was at University of Washington um, and the Seattle Children's Hospital. And over the 23 years of his tenure there, he and his team worked on 015787 and its link with um, hemolytic uremia syndrome in children. Our second speaker is going to be Dr. Jeff Lejeune. Dr. Lejeune is a professor at The Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine, and he was at WSU in the past as a resident and a graduate student in the diagnostic laboratory looking at the ecology and epidemiology of E. coli 015787H7. Right now, Dr. Lejeune's research is focused on pre-harvest controls for not only um, E. coli coming from animals, but also produce. Our third speaker is our own Dr. Tom Besser. Tom is a professor in the Department of Veterinary Microbiology and Pathology here at the College of Veterinary Medicine at WSU. His focus is in food and waterborne diseases, and particularly animal reservoirs for diseases like Salmonella, E. coli 0157H7, and Campylobacter. And he's also looked at antimicrobial resistance. And our final speaker um, is Dr. David Smith. He's a professor of veterinary science in the Veterinary and Biological Sciences Department at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His focus is as an epidemiologist in food safety, and he primarily looks at pre-harvest controls at the beef realm. He spent a little bit of time looking at E. coli vaccination, and we'll be talking about that today. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Washington State University Extension also our full partner in this, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and then also thanks to Iowa State University for pushing out this signal to those of you in the audience. I want to thank you ahead of time for participating in this webinar and for your attendance. I will turn the podium over to Dr. Phil Tarr. Uh, in the 22 years that I've been working with Tom Besser uh, on this problem, we've learned a lot, and regrettably, we still have a lot more to learn and I think this is an excellent forum for bringing in the, the diverse constituencies that are going to have to uh, address the problem of food and environmental microbiologic uh, safety. All right, E. coli 0157H7 uh, is a uh, rare infection. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control has conducted very good uh, population-based incidence uh, surveillance uh, via the FoodNet system. And the incidence is about 0.9 cases per 100,000 uh, people uh, per year. Uh, this really translates uh, to three, four, 5,000 cases diagnosed in the United States uh, per annum. Uh, if one calculates the uh, typical hemolytic uremic syndrome rate, 
uh, based on the fact that about 90% of them, these cases occur in children under the age of 18. There's about 500 to 750 uh, cases uh, of HUS uh, per annum in the United States. Now this is a really rare infection. Uh, physicians uh, taking care of children and adults are not likely to see very many of these cases uh, in the course of a career. So rare infections, rare events need good systems, good protocols, and good vigilance in place before the infection occurs. And based on that, I'm going to discuss how I believe in 2011 we can optimally diagnose this infection, how we can uh, improve the outcome uh, from E. coli 0157H7 infections, and by extensions from infections with other sugar toxin producing E. coli, and also address some misconceptions in the process. Now on this next slide, uh, this is the uh, motif of these illnesses. Time is not on your side. In the vast majority of medicine, in the vast majority of pediatrics, one can afford uh, to evaluate a patient and see how things play out over the next several days, not with E. coli 0157H7. Uh, children and adults rarely present until the diarrhea uh, that they experience with this infection turns bloody. It'll turn bloody about two or three days into illness. By day five or six, kidney failure, as demonstrated on this slide of a biopsy, is already established. So you have two, three, perhaps four days uh, to do any sort of an intervention uh, and if you don't recognize the possibility that a patient might be infected with an E. coli, you will lose a, a precious day while awaiting a culture result. Uh, or if the specimen is not handled appropriately, you will lose the backup mechanism of a positive culture result to inform you that something is going on. So therefore, uh, based on data uh, collected uh, by Dr. Eileen Klein in Seattle Children's Hospital, uh, and collated by Dr. Lori Holtz at Washington University. This is what we have uh, generally recommended. Uh, basically, uh, a patient who comes in with diarrhea that's bloody should be considered to have an E. coli 0157H7 infection. The, the profile is that there's non-bloody diarrhea that, then that is then followed by acute onset of bloody diarrhea about one to three days later. These patients are rarely, rarely have a fever. Uh, their abdomen is quite frequently tender and they have had five or more bowel movements in the previous 24 hours. Uh, commonly, pain is worse on having a bowel movement. Uh, tests that one can obtain at the time of presentation really do not help rule in or rule out E. coli 0157H7, such as fecal leukocytes uh, or white blood cell count. So basically, a physician at a point of presentation, and in North America that usually means an emergency room, needs to be vigilant to this possibility and treat it with all the priority and all the urgency of treating a heart attack. Now the next most uh, critical point in the, uh, in the uh, chain of events that leads to a well-managed patient is outstanding, rapid, and accurate microbiology. And the, the backbone of microbiology in diagnosing a uh, acute bloody diarrhea in North America is standard culture. A uh, panel of pathogens should be sought. E. coli 0157H7 should be sought on all stools submitted. Uh, Salmonella, Shigella, uh, and Campylobacter should also be sought uh, simultaneously. It is absolutely critical that that specimen gets to that plate as quickly as possible. Uh, at our hospital, at St. Louis Children's Hospital, a policy was implemented several years ago such that all stools will be plated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that can often buy you an extra day in terms of getting the diagnosis uh, quicker. Stool coming in at 6 or 7 p.m. need not wait until 8 a.m. the following morning to get onto a sorbitol McConkey agar plate. Uh, so uh, one system's opportunity here is get the specimen to the lab and to the plate and also to the broth as rapidly as you can. Uh, so lesson one, the first microbiologic evaluation is critical. This is your last best opportunity to find the pathogen and get it growing and get the patient handled well. Uh, the next opportunity is to decide what to do once the specimen is in the lab. Certainly all stools should be plated on sorbitol agar in the hope of finding 
uh, an E. coli 0157, which is that colorless colony uh, on the left side of the plate indicated by the arrow. Now, an increasing number of laboratories are also using the toxin assay. Briefly, stool is put into a broth. The broth is incubated overnight, and the next day, uh, the stool is tested uh, for uh, one or more shiga toxins using a commercial uh, toxin uh, enzyme immunoassay. Uh, this is a very uh, good test. It's been available for about 15 years, and it is critical that both technologies be applied in parallel, not using the toxin assay to state whether or not the sorbitol McConkey agar plate should be done, rather setting up both tests at once simultaneously on receipt. The reason is that E. coli 0157H7 remains the single serotype that is the nearly exclusive cause of hemolytic uremic syndrome in the United States, uh, Canada, uh, the UK, Japan, and South America year after year. And getting that isolate, getting that colorless isolate and not a toxin signal uh, is what the provider needs and most microbiologic uh, uh, clinical labs can provide that information on the next day. Uh, these are a variety of references that demonstrate for the past 25 years E. coli 0157H7 remains the predominant and near exclusive cause of diarrhea associated HUS, at least in children, worldwide. Therefore, one must get that organism as quickly as possible. Now, non-0157 shigatoxin-producing E. coli certainly can cause the hemolytic uremic syndrome. We've just seen the tragedy uh, in Europe where E. coli 0104 uh, went through a largely adult population and caused an unprecedented number of fatalities. Uh, fortunately, we have not seen this pathogen in the United States. We may or may not ever see this pathogen. We need to be vigilant for this organism and similar organisms. Uh, but overall, HUS remains the predominant cause, pre predominantly caused by a single serotype 0157H7. Uh, one study uh, published about 10 years ago from the Centers for Disease Control uh, was an outstanding effort to look nationwide at HUS. Uh, they f this uh, group found uh, E. coli 0157H7 was predominant and did find from five patients non-0157 shigatoxin producing E. coli. Four of those patients were also tested via their blood for antibody evidence to E. coli 0157H7 and three of those four seem to have been simultaneously or recently infected with E. coli 0157H7. From uh, two-thirds of the patients from whom neither an 0157 nor a non-0157 shigatoxin-producing E. coli was found in the stool, two-thirds of those patients had antibodies to E. coli 0157. So at least in the United States, as of that study, there was little room left for non-0157H7s uh, to cause uh, hemolytic uh, uremic syndrome associated with diarrhea. In a recent study, uh, 10 centers in the United States, one in Scotland, uh, studying children with the hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, Dr. Christina Hickey identified that 28 of those children were infected with an E. coli uh, that was a sugar toxin producing organism in their stool. 27 of them w uh, had E. coli 0157H7 as the uh, pathogen. Uh, a recent study uh, from Connecticut uh, demonstrates a similar epidemiology on a statewide basis. Uh, briefly, uh, there were 663 uh, shigatoxin-producing uh, E. coli infections identified either by culture uh, or by toxin EIA in the course of a decade. Um, about 40% uh, were E. coli 0157 and about 60% we're 90157. Remember, this is a statewide uh, analysis, not an analysis of children with hemolytic uremic syndrome uh, or in an emergency room. Uh, when one looked at the fate of the children who had 0157 and non 0157, uh, there was a 10% rate, HUS rate among the children infected with E. coli 0157H7, I should say children and adults and only one of the 229 uh, individuals in Connecticut in that decade who had uh, a non-0157 infection uh, with a sugar toxin producing E. coli uh, developed HUS. Uh, furthermore, about a fifth of the isolates uh, by the time they got to the reference laboratory at the state uh, either 
the test could not be repeated. The broth did not uh, prove positive uh, on a repeat toxin assay, or despite the state's best effort, no uh, pathogen uh, was identified. So uh, it's a good test. In the right context, it can be very helpful clinically and epidemiologically. But again, E. coli 0157H7 remains the target for the vast majority of cases. Uh, so I've put together here a, a pyramid looking at where somebody presents and the likelihood of them having an E. coli 0157H7 infection versus a non-0157 infection. If you examine individuals with kidney failure, 95 to possibly 99% of them in North America will have an E. coli 0157 in their stool or serologic evidence of E. coli in their blood. If you go down that pyramid a little bit to an emergency room in three separate decades, uh, the data are reported here, uh, we find that the balance actually still remains predominantly two to one, approximately, in favor of E. coli 0157 to non 0157s. However, once one goes to a statewide surveillance, such as Montana in 1998 to 2000, or Connecticut in the past decade, that ratio flips. 0157H7 is about one-third of the isolates, non-0157s, as one goes down this acuity in uh, pyramid, uh, predominate. So again, 0157H7 remains the pathogen that is most likely in North America and Europe, much of the world, uh, to seriously injure a child's kidney, uh, actually to cause epidemics, hospitalizations, and serious complications. There should not be any delay in trying to find this organism. And there's a lot of appeal to doing toxin assay screening, and I think it's a great idea to do in parallel with sorbitol macanchiagar plate uh, microbiology. However, for reasons that are unclear, enzyme immunoassay misses uh, about 5 to 10 percent in series after series, and I've listed the references here, uh, of 0157 is missed by the toxin assay. We do not know why that is. Um, this could have to do with the biology of the organism or test performance. But if you want to find E. coli 0157H7, and it, the counter, it, and it is counterintuitive, but a toxin assay is not the screening test uh, to perform. <clears throat> toxin assays, if used alone without the sorbitol macanchiagar, slow the diagnosis of E. coli 0157H7. Uh, they're not performed daily. They probably should be if you're going to be doing them. They are often sent to commercial labs outside the state of presentation of the patient. Uh, the isolation then devolves to the state public health laboratory. The state of isolation, as I said, is not always the state of presentation or residence of the patient. There are specimen transport issues. Once a broth becomes a toxin positive broth, it now is a category A biohazard subjected to much more stringent transportation regulations uh, by the Department of Transportation, the FAA, and IATA. So uh, a positive broth uh, could obligate a week or more work to get that E. coli 0157H7 isolated, identified, and into the hands uh, of the uh, state authorities because they really need that isolate to move forward with epidemiologic investigations uh, built on fingerprint. Uh, e. coli 0157, as I stated, causes HUS in an appreciable subset of patients. The other serotypes rarely do. Syndromic profile is helpful. Uh, as I stated, a child with acute bloody diarrhea should, should be uh, evaluated and taken very seriously. But the clinician really needs to know the next day, is it growing an 0157 or not? Uh, the health department, as I stated, needs that isolate. And now we may have a, a low-tech but potentially very uh, powerful um, uh, intervention, which I'll discuss. So again, best practices, plate 24-7. Don't wait for the morning shift. Swabs are fine. Uh, report presumptive positives to your clinicians as quickly as you can. Doing this, our Children's Hospital in St. Louis has uh, gotten the time from receipt of specimen down to a presumptive call uh, to the clinician that a 0157 might be on the plate to under 24 hours. Centers for Disease Control agrees with this and states that all submitted stools should be simultaneously plated on sorbitol macanchiagar to detect E. coli 0157H7 and also uh, should undergo toxin testing. Again, do not forsake the plate for the toxin assay. 
Uh, these, are, I think, were very good recommendations, very well considered with a panel of industry uh, and uh, scientists uh, and public health officers uh, convened by the Centers for Disease Control a couple years ago. So why is the hustle? After all, this is just diarrhea. Well, when these patients present, uh, it's been demonstrated that they have a massive thrombotic load already in their blood vessels. Even though their blood counts are perfectly normal, even though their kidneys have yet to shut down, when they present on or before day four of illness, they have a major pro-thrombotic uh, tendency in their blood. This is analogous to a heart attack. Uh, and these patients cannot be easily uh, identified by physical examination or standard laboratory tests. So you got the pathogen still in the stool. Uh, the kidneys are not yet injured. The coagulation system is activated. Uh, if you can profile a patient, what can you do? Well, first you should admit and isolate them. Dirk Verber, uh, when he uh, performed research in the UK, demonstrated that this low-tech uh, approach, get these children out of circulation, was a terrific way uh, to prevent secondary cases uh, and hemolytic uremic syndrome in the community. Uh, the children who present uh, are excreting at the height of their illness, 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th E. coli O157H7 per gram of stool. Over the next several days, that excretion burden will go down and they will become less of a threat to the community. But on presentation, they should be admitted and isolated with contact precautions. Dr. Craig Wong, uh, about 10 years ago, published a paper demonstrating the risk of giving antibiotics on presentation. Those data still hold in an extended study he has performed in a recent study published by uh, Dr. Kirk Smith's group uh, from the state of Minnesota, uh, also suggested that antibiotics are a risk factor for developing hemolytic uremic syndrome if given to patients uh, with bloody diarrhea. Nonetheless, antibiotics are commonly prescribed in this country, uh, and I've given references uh, below as to uh, the uh, still appreciable empiric use of giving antibiotics with or without appropriate microbiology when people present with acute bloody diarrhea. Well then, what can you do for the patient? We have strongly uh, encouraged uh, admitting the hospital and then starting an IV and giving uh, good volume expansion not with uh, hypotonic saline, but with isotonic saline, normal saline, uh, and observing these patients uh, closely. Uh, the goal here is in the subset of patients who develop hemolytic uremic syndrome, there's actually two kinds. There's the oliguric kind, where the urine stops. Uh, that's shown on the right. Uh, then there's the non-oliguric kind, where the urine flow continues. If children have oligo and uric HUS, they almost always require dialysis. They will stay in hospital for several weeks. Their short-term and long-term complication rate is much higher. A variety of papers listed here uh, attest uh, to the fact that it is better to continue urinating during kidney failure than not to continue urinating. So what variables were associated with good outcomes? Uh, Dr. Julie Ake published a paper about five years ago that suggested that the first that an IV being started early in illness was associated with a good outcome if a patient develops hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, what was fascinating in that study was that the microbiologist have a, had a major role here, that a microbiologist had picked up the phone and told the attending physician this patient is infected with an E. coli O157H7. If that patient went on to develop hemolytic uremic syndrome, that phone call, that early in illness phone call, was associated with a much better outcome. Uh, for that reason, we strongly encourage, again, sorbitol aggregate plating, expeditious analysis of any resulting uh, colony. Uh, Dr. A uh, then uh, demonstrated that volume was the biggest determinant. It wasn't so much the phone call, but it was bringing back the children and giving them a good intravenous uh, volume expansion, and the data uh, are in the referenced uh, article here. Uh, this study was repeated uh, by Dr. Hickey uh, at Washington University in 10 centers in the United States and one in Scotland, and she found the same uh, data. Uh, this uh, work was considered sufficiently significant for the editor of the journal uh, to release this uh, paper early in the hopes that it would uh, affect practice uh, during uh, the still current HUS season. So again, Every second counts when a patient presents with a possible or a definite E. coli O157H7 infection. This is not something that you can say, come back tomorrow and we'll see how you're doing. Uh, and systems, people on this phone, 
people on this webinar may have a role to play here. Uh, specimens should be, get, should be gotten to that plate as quickly as possible. Uh, don't wait for a stool necessarily, a swab is just fine. Uh, when you get a colorless colony in a microbiology laboratory, if it's big enough, do an agglutination assay on it and pick up the phone and call the requesting physician and say this could be an E. coli 0157H7. Uh, you will be microbiologists call with a gram-positive coccus growing in a blood culture. They don't necessarily know that it's a staph, a strep, or a pneumococcus. Doctor needs to know what is happening in the microbiology lab. This cannot afford to wait until the next day in determination of the H antigen and confirmation that it is an E. coli. And finally, uh, physicians and microbiologists have a role to play in getting uh, the information about definite cases, any observed clusters of cases, and getting that isolate uh, to the appropriate uh, local health department. Uh, even if your state allows you a week to report uh, a positive, as some states still do, just pick up the phone and get that illness reported. Uh, I strongly discourage uh, physicians uh, from doing aperture epidemiology, but I strongly encourage them to getting the health department involved as quickly as possible. So to summarize, patient might have an E. coli infection, hospitalize them, hydrate them intravenously, hold antibiotics, and notify the health department. Thank you very much.